Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for Puff Service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Bread dough being readied for the ovens of a bakery at Port Chester, New York. The dough moves fast when it moves, all right. But the periods of kneading, rising, and resting, all essential to the baking of good bread, are allotted their necessary minutes or hours. In fact, in a modern plant like that of Arnold Bakers Incorporated, mixing times, oven temperatures, and other critical factors are much more closely controlled than would ever be possible in baking bread at home. Combine this careful control with the use of the finest ingredients and you soon discover why comparatively little bread is baked at home these days. Here the bread goes into the oven in pans that are covered to hold in flavor. This bread, after cooling and being sliced and wrapped, will undergo a process not customary with baked goods of any kind. It will be frozen. At 20 below zero, the loaves will become hard as rocks in about four hours. A double wrapper prevents the bread from being dehydrated by the very dry air in the freezing and cold storage compartments. What's the reason for freezing bread? Well, there are two. By freezing and storing the product, the company can level off its work schedule, eliminating the peaks and valleys of employment that used to occur around holidays, vacation times, and the like. In addition to stabilizing employment at the plant, freezing the bread also increases employment by letting the company extend its market by hundreds, even thousands of miles. Customers in Miami or Detroit now get bread with the same oven fresh flavor as do those within a few blocks of the bakery. It doesn't matter if the bread was baked today or a month ago, the freshness is frozen in. For long hauls, refrigerator trucks are used to keep the temperature well below the point at which bread begins to get stale. The idea for preserving the freshness of bread by freezing it came from the famous Admiral Richard E. Byrd, who found bread left at the South Pole perfectly edible on his return four years later. And now, as Vice President of Arnold Bakers, Admiral Byrd, with company president Paul Dean Arnold, tests the palatability of a loaf of before. Of all the results of the Admiral's expeditions, we call this the most unusual. Population experts tell us we'll number 220 millions by 1975, 60 millions more than now. These new Americans will need many things. These luxuries will be tomorrow's necessities. Machine development will make this dream a reality. In addition to goods of every description, Americans in 1975 will need more jobs to support an expanding population. Can we have wonderful and more efficient machines and jobs in increasing numbers at the same time? The history of industry says we can. The practice of industry says we will. Ever met a homemaker who was completely satisfied with her household arrangements? Well, neither have we. And this one is no exception. She wants a window over her range, both for light and for view. This is good news for companies like National Woodworks of Birmingham, which specializes in the manufacture of prefabricated window and door units in a wide range of standard sizes. Founded in 1946 on a capital of only $10,000, the small company has grown to a position of preeminence in this section of the country, achieving its remarkable growth by helping to hold down building costs during a period of unprecedented construction activity. Formerly, windows and doors had to be fitted a house by an expert hand craftsman who worked by trial and error. Now the units come complete with glass, trim, sash, frame, weather stripping, hardware and screens, all pre-assembled and ready to be set in place in a matter of minutes. 
as we'll see here at the home of the woman in need of a brighter kitchen. Although most of the windows and doors go into new buildings, there's also quite a lot of business in the modernization of older structures. Here's where the new window will go. He makes four lines on the siding, drills a hole, gets a start with the keyhole saw, switches to a cross-cut saw, and before you know it, there's the opening. In the old days, this would be just the start of a long, painstaking, expensive job. But now the installation is practically complete. A few nails, a couple of coats of paint, and who would ever dream that window hadn't been planned by the original architect? unit, which will be taken apart and put together again, first by the instructor, then by the mechanics themselves. In the current hot competition among auto manufacturers, the servicing a car will get after it has been purchased has become an important factor. The car makers do everything in their power to ensure their customers as many carefree miles of motoring as possible. Have you noticed how many more miles a motorist gets out of a car now, as compared, say, with the days before World War II? This is one of the reasons. Not only the big city garages, but small one or two man shops also are visited. Here, Ed calls on dealer Mac McAtee of Belleville, Michigan, to explain to Mac and mechanic Marv Byron the ins and outs of power flight transmission. About 80% of new car buyers choose the same make they have been driving. Thus, the repeat business constitutes a percentage of the manufacturer's trade, without which he would be sunk. Sounds like a contradiction, but the longer a car lasts, operating economically year in and year out, the better it is for the firm that produced the car. So it's obvious that for us pampered motorists, programs like the mobile service training units and other similar efforts mean a lot of things. All of them good for us. Expecting our country to move ahead without the chance for a fair profit is like expecting an automobile to run without gas or oil. The expectation of profits led investors and businessmen to seek newer and better fabrics, refrigerators, washing machines, and thousands of other articles. Billions of dollars plowed back into industry helped it expand at an astonishing rate. Profits make products. Profits create jobs. Profits mean progress. Let's ensure tomorrow's jobs and living standards by encouraging the quest for profits instead of discouraging it through high and discriminatory taxes. the art department of one of the nation's leading producers of greeting cards. The artist preparing the dummy of a new birthday card utilizes a technique called flocking, whereby the design can be felt as well as seen. The drawing painted in glue is sprinkled with minute textile fibers, which adhere only to the glue and create a three-dimensional furry effect. The flocking technique has made possible the printing of rust craft greeting cards for the blind here in Dedham, Massachusetts. First, the cards are printed, unfolded on conventional printing presses for the benefit of sighted persons who might buy them for blind friends. The side that will be hidden shows how to sign the card in Braille. 
To print the greeting in Braille, metal plates are embossed like this at the Perkins Institute for the Blind. The arrangement of dots stamped into the metal spell out words to the trained fingertips of one who cannot read ordinary writing. Back at Rustcraft, the Braille dots that carry a message of love or sympathy or congratulations are impressed into the printed greeting cards. Meanwhile, working from the dummy we saw being prepared earlier, other workers make the silk screens that'll be used in applying glue to the cards on a mass production basis. A piece of acetate is laid over the dummy and a cutout is made following exactly the lines of the drawing beneath. Slow, painstaking work this, yet the company produces cards for the blind as a public service at cost. Now the acetate cutout is joined to a silk screen held taut on a wooden form. Now where the acetate has been cut out, it will be possible to force glue or sizing through the silk screen onto the greeting card. Here's how the sizing is applied. They just run a squeegee over the screen and the sizing oozes through in a uniform layer. Then the cards are whizzed down a chute to women who apply the flocking. A vibrating bar distributes the fibers evenly and shakes off the excess before the cards are set out to dry, then are folded, placed in envelopes, boxed and shipped to retail outlets like this one, where a wide array of greeting cards is on hand with selections available for every imaginable occasion Births, confirmations, graduations, illnesses, weddings, anniversaries, holidays, and all the other dates on which we want to send others our best wishes. Here, a customer, following the directions, punches out his signature in Braille with a pencil. And here's the recipient, a resident of that world of darkness, into which rays of light can penetrate only through the ear and the tips of the fingers. Someone has remembered her birthday. The poetry may not be up to the standards of Wordsworth, Keats, or Shelley, but to her, it's sweet music indeed. Venice, the fascinating city of canals, a must stop for all world travelers, is the scene of a unique sporting event. The famous Venetian regatta is being held for the 650th recorded time in history. The ancient race follows a procession of historic boats with costume passengers on the Grand Canal. And lovely Venetian ladies flourish everywhere. The great gondola regatta is underway. The gondolas, the symbol of Venetian tradition, are manned by the finest oarsmen to be found in the Italian seaport town. Before entering the Grand Canal, the gondoliers must row across a lagoon. The entire race covers seven kilometers. Every available vantage point is being overrun because to the Venetians, the regatta is the counterpart of our World Series, Rose Bowl, and Kentucky Derby all rolled into one. World famous San Marco forms the backdrop at this point in the race. The nine gondolas have entered the Grand Canal and are passing under the first of several bridges spanning the fabled waterway. The regatta has been a spectacular event throughout all periods of the history of the Venetian Republic. It is a sporting competition in which technique and strength play dominant roles. Thousands of tourists are on hand for the colorful event, which is sandwiched in between days of celebration by a spirited people.
The closely bunched gondolas are nearing the halfway juncture where they'll swing around a pylon and double back. The Venetian gondoliers, romanticized in song and story, are a tightly knit group. The task of propelling these narrow boats with the high peaks at each end belongs to only a few. Jobs are handed down from generation to generation. The magnificent structure known as the Rialto Bridge slips out of sight as the race enters its final stages and still no one team has chosen to take charge completely. The finish is going to be extremely close. In the final yards, the gondola with the oarsman Stregetta in the stern noses into the lead. Stregetta has followed the strategy he followed twice before blazing back in a very close second position all the way, then inching ahead at the very last. Only six tenths of a second separates the winning boat on the left from the second place gondola. Stregetta raises his oar in a victory salute. This is Stregetta's 13th Venice Regatta victory and a cause for much rejoicing. The Mardi Gras atmosphere will prevail into the wee hours, and no doubt the canal will be filled with revelers before this holiday has ended. After that, the citizens can look happily ahead to next year, when the ritual will be carried out again at the 651st Venice Regatta.